Okay, this is work we've been doing for a while. We're looking at qubit lattice algorithms. Initially, we're doing this for quantum turbulence. And more recently, we've started going back to plasma physics and looking at wave propagation in plasmas. The idea of a qubit lattice algorithm is, first of all, connect up the fields to the qubits. We then have to devise, basically it's like a collide stream algorithm similar to lattice Boltzmann, except that the collision operators are unitary. So the collision operators will entangle the qubits locally at each lattice site. The streaming operators will then move this entanglement throughout the lattice. And then we have to introduce another potential operator because there's derivatives on the refractive index. It is non-unitary, but we can approximate that by a linear sum of, of unitary operators. The early work we did in quantum turbulence, in particular, we were looking at spin one and spin two BECs. That's basically three coupled nonlinear Schrodinger equation. That's basically the nonlinear Schrodinger equation right here. Psi is a spinner. And this is the interaction, the spin interaction term. And it turns out it's a non diagonal operator, but it's tri idempotent. And so when you make your evolution operator, you can actually evaluate it to all orders. Here we're seeing basically the effect of quantum vortices, how initially for the different n plus or minus one zero. And then how you get basically vortex reconnection and basically going into turbulence. The idea of the algorithm was that while it will be able to run on a quantum computer, it's ideally paralyzed on a classical computer. And for example, on Myra, uh, we, for example, ran over half a million cores and the parallelization was 94. 4.1% and it was over one petaflop. So now we're moving to our recent work where we want to look basically at scattering in basically a plasma. And the simplest way of going it is go to Maxwell's, sorry, go to Maxwell's equations and work with the dielectric and then make it into a tensor and then eventually put in the two fluid equations for the species and get a full nonlinear system out of it. So our first approach is, okay, let's look at 2D scattering. So the refractive index, it's tensor, but it's a function of X and Y. The variable that's required to get a unitary representation, you get that from what's known as the Dyson map. And it's not the straight fields, electric fields, magnetic fields, but it's weighted with the refractive index in that direction. You can then work out Maxwell's equations in 2D. And it's a fairly simple system. And now to devise the collision operator, we, for example, look at the coupling between DDT and DDX. So that means qubit Q1 couples to Q5. And then we see qubit Q2 couples to qubit Q4. And so that tells us that the collision operator being unitary, it's a rotation operator. That's where you couple Q1 to Q5. This is Q0 and this is Q5. And then this is the coupling between Q2 and Q4. And then the angle in rotation depends basically on the coefficient of the derivative. You play the same game in the y direction, the y coupling. And then you've got to be smart enough to figure out what qubits do you stream and what you don't. And you work it out in Mathematica and you finish up with a unitary evolution sequence like this. It's collide stream, collide stream. These are unitary, but and they do not commute. And then you basically use in some sense, the adjoint of it, so that you get a second order accurate scheme in the spatial derivatives. If you only looked at the first four, then you get the first order scheme. Similarly in the Y. Then you've got to account for 
the derivatives in the refractive index because it's in homogeneous system. And these are non-unitary. You can then approximate them by a linear combination of unity. That's a sort of a standard trick that they use in quantum algorithms. Of course, on a classical supercomputer, you don't have to worry about that. So what you finish up basically is a nice collide stream algorithm. And it is ideally parallelized that we've seen on classical supercomputers. And in principle, of course, it'll run on an error correcting quantum computer, but it needs quite a few qubits, obviously. So we have six qubits per spatial grid, and then the number of grid nodes, etc. So it's a lot of qubits. So now what we're going to look at is some simulation results where we're going to have a 1D pulse, an electromagnetic pulse propagating in the X direction. And we're going to look at scattering from a dielectric cone. So this is basically the refractive index and the difference between scattering from a cone and a cylinder. In the cylinder case, we've got a fairly sharp boundary layer between the dielectric and vacuum. And here it's a very slowly changing boundary between the two. What we have to keep track of carefully is, of course, is the conservation of energy. And in the simulations, we're showing the energy is conserved to the seventh digit. So what we're looking at here is a simulation of, this is our 1D pulse, you see here. And it's propagating in the, it's a Gaussian propagating in the X direction, and it's going to be interacting with the dielectric cone. So what you're seeing is a fairly simple, this is the electric field we're looking at. And so the electric field is, you can see the interaction coming. now interacts with the cone. What This is an initial value code. So it's different from like standard boundary value codes, which will not see transient effects. And so what you're seeing here is what looks like interference effects. But because of the interaction with this cone, there is no basically bouncing of the electric field within the cone because it's like a WKB-like solution. So that's why you get a very simple ring, which is due to basically the effects of the scattering from the apex of the cone. We now look at the interaction at the solar cone. This is now the looking at the interaction with a cylinder dielectric, and you see a much more complicated structure, and that's because and we'll see it in more detail when we look specifically at the dielectric cylinder itself. The signal basically, as it propagates in the X direction, it will basically bounce between the walls and some will tunnel through and some will be transmitted back. And that's why you see this fairly complicated wavefront structure in the electric field. This is a picture of basically what the cone looks like relative to the cylinder. What you're seeing here is a Gaussian pulse. You're looking on top. And so this is basically a cylinder. And there's the refractive index. Here is three and one is in the vacuum. And so it propagates in. Because the phase velocity of the wave front is less in the dielectric than in the vacuum, you basically see the pulse propagating past the cylinder. And now you're seeing some of the reflections going backwards and forwards in the cylinder. And this is basically the, the pulse that's been generated. So as one looks at it, there you start to see the interaction. What you see here is the reflection 
which you typically see like in 1D when you do E&M graduate level, even undergraduate, you basically have a refracted, reflected E field. And if you're going from a high to low refractive index, the E field is negative, it switches phase. And that's what you're seeing outside here. This is the wave front within the dielectric. And because the refractive index is higher, the phase velocity is C over N. And that's why you start seeing this sort of the shape. The, this is the propagation of the pulse in vacuum. And this is the effect inside the dielectric. And then it just, there you start to see a constructive interference, that's that spike. And then you'll start to see it started to propagate towards the boundary. It then, some is transmitted and some is reflected back. We then looked at the effect, for example, of a wave packet as it propagates onto a cone. So this is the apex of the cone, and this is the refractive index of the cone as you're going in. So that it's coming in, you can now see the bending of the rays because this is the periodic oscillations in the wave packet. Here it's wrapping around the cone. Now what you're going to see is some constructive interference near the edge of the cone. But what you'll see is that the signal will propagate directly out of the cone and there's no bouncing within the cone. It's like a WKB-like solution. And our final slide is, again, a wave packet, but now going into an elliptic cylinder. So this is, again, looking on top from the Z direction. This is the XY plane you're looking at. And we're going to have a look at how the propagates, and you'll see the bouncing within the dielectric. So this is the wave packet. Within the cylinder, it's lower phase velocity. Again, you see coming out is the initial reflection. And now you're going to see quite a lot of constructive interference and the two foci of the ellipse playing a role. And outside, of course, the cylinder is your vacuum. And it And again, these are transient effects, which you don't see if you're doing like a boundary value problem. And it just keeps going like this. So to summarize, we're now moving to scattering from 3D objects. The next stage is getting to be a more complicated dielectric where you have both dispersion and dissipation. And you can still handle this because in quantum optics, they discuss quite often what are known as open quantum systems. And the system itself is non-unitary, but you can embed it into a high dimensional space where it is unitary. And it's called cross operators is one way of doing it. Um, and now we're thinking also we can be able to handle the full problem of nonlinear two fluid equations with Maxwell, where we actually do what's known as the Madelung transformation on the BEC work that we've done earlier. Uh, basically putting psi is the square root of rho e to the i phi, the velocity is the gradient of phi. And from there, you can then get the momentum equations, continuity equations, we have to go to quaternions to eliminate the quantum pressure terms because we want to be doing classical modeling. And so we want basically get non-singular classical vortices. Thank you. <laughs>